Hello everyone, I'm Anush Yastani. I'm the Director of Research and Education for the Queensland Fertility Group and a Director of EFHealth Australia. And this is a synopsis of the presentation of the World Congress of Endometriosis in 2017. Good morning and welcome to the World Endometriosis Meeting in Vancouver. So the World Congress of endometriosis in 2017 was run in Vancouver. It was at the Vancouver Convention Centre and this year there were over a thousand delegates that attended the meeting. As part of this meeting, the Australasian Gynecological Endoscopy and Surgical Society, or AGES, ran a workshop on surgical strategies to tackle endometriosis chaired by Alan Lamb, past president, uh, myself as the immediate past president, and also uh, Associate Professor um, Jason Abbott, who is now the uh, current president. So the topic uh, was, should we tackle endometriosis in infertility? And this is my declaration of interest. And again, uh, important here to notice that all of the views expressed in this presentation are uniquely my own and do not necessarily reflect any of the organisations that I represent. So when we're talking about infertility, we're really talking about three components. We're talking about sperm, we're talking about the egg, and we're talking about organs to allow them to come together and to allow for a pregnancy to escape. In obstetrics and gynaecology, we normally consider these as the pelvic factor, the mouth factor, and the ovular factor. And as a subspecialist, I still assess every single couple or every person that comes and sees me based on those three factors. If we're looking specifically at the pelvic environment, then the pelvis, in fact, affects a number of areas. It is where fertilization occurs, implantation occurs, and finally a pregnancy ensues and continues. And endometriosis, in fact, affects all of these. This presentation, which looks at fertility, will consider the impact of all of these. So how does endometriosis affect fertility? Well, since we're here in Vancouver, we're going to keep a little scoreboard of whether or not surgical management of endometriosis compared to medical management or observational management plays a greater role. So firstly, endometriosis causes anatomical distortion. And this quite clearly can occur in situations where the tubes are obstructed, so the sperm and the egg can't get together. And surgery quite clearly addresses this issue, so we give a score to surgery. The pelvic environment is also changed within endometriosis. It is an inflammatory condition and removing the source of inflammation, meaning the endometriosis implants, may improve uh, chances of conceiving based on the information that we have. So again, it is a score for endometriosis surgery. There are a number of functional changes, however, that also occur with endometriosis. We know that the function of the tube is altered, ovarian function is altered, there's an increased risk of disovulation, there is an altered motility of the uterus, and these changes will not be affected by um, surgery. So score plus one for expectant or non-surgical management. Endometriosis treatment in itself also affects fertility and in fact it delays conception and all data points that all the treatment that we have, so for example delays from surgery or post-operative management reduce the chances of falling pregnant. So again score plus one for expectant management. The ovarian reserve is reduced in women with endometriosis. Now, unfortunately, surgery appears to reduce ovarian reserve more 
particularly if there is surgery on uh, ovarian disease or an endometrioma. So plus one for non-surgical management. And finally, pain is a significant factor in endometriosis and affecting fertility. If you cannot have sex, you cannot conceive. And surgery has been clearly demonstrated to reduce pain and to reduce pain with sex. So again, this is a score. So we now find ourselves in an equipose. What do we do about this? There seem to be appropriate advantages for each of the management strategies. So which way should we go? Well, when we're looking at evidence um, for the management of endometriosis, we're going to talk about the evidence pyramid. And at the top of the pyramid is a systematic review of which Cochrane is one modality. Randomized controlled trials are the next level of evidence, then pseudo-randomized trials, controlled comparative studies then provide the next level, finally uncontrolled comparative studies and case series or reviews. So at the top we have systematic reviews and that is the best way to guide our decision making process between these two modalities. Unfortunately, when it comes to endometriosis, we're really talking mainly about uncontrolled comparative studies of case series or reports, and therefore the level of evidence that we have is significantly lower. So what is the effect on spontaneous pregnancy of level 1 to 2 endometriosis as shown over here? So we now have good evidence that resection or ablation of minimal and mild endometriosis increases spontaneous pregnancy rates. And this is the data from the uh, Cochrane review, which um, quite clearly shows that there is an increased chance of conceiving with an OR of 1.94. You will notice that the Italian group has now been taken out of the Cochrane review, and we have the GARD study instead that provides the second RCT as part of this. If we look at the data from the Marcou study as published in the England Journal of Medicine in 1997, you will see that there is a significant increase in the chance of conceiving with laparoscopic surgery. Um, though, in fact, if we're looking at the time frames over here, you will see that, in fact, very large. So level one evidence that there is a good effect on spontaneous pregnancy, but the effect of as, uh, mild disease on assisted reproduction is in fact less clear and we don't have any good evidence for this. At best, this is likely to have a mild to minimal effect. If we're looking at the effect of level three to four disease on spontaneous pregnancy, then we have data that is of level two that suggests that there is an increase in the chance of spontaneous pregnancy uh, with the removal of severe disease. Now, most of these are case series and uncontrolled studies, but we do have some data from randomized controlled uh, studies. However, all of these studies are really affected by the duration of infertility by the selection of the control groups, the co-interventions that occur with this, and the methodological difficulties in blinding patients to the surgical intervention. Particularly, there's also a selection bias in that only certain centers will continue this type of um, intervention. And finally, we tend to publish positive results more than negative results, so there's significant publication bias. And again, if we're looking at the effect of endometriosis in this situation. So you will see that there is a significant increase in spontaneous fertility um, after uh, surgical resection of endometriosis. Though again, we're talking at about low pregnancy rates comparatively. The effect on assisted reproduction of level three to four disease, again, is limited. 
talking about an endometrioma or a collection of endometriosis within the ovary, we have level two evidence that resection of an endometrioma will improve spontaneous conception rates. And again, this is data from the Maggiore study from 2017, which quite clearly shows that women with an endometrioma will do better with resection, but certainly women with endometrioma do worse than women with non-ovarian disease. So what is the effect on IVF and of an endometrioma? And here we have reasonably good evidence that um, observational management of an endometrioma avoids surgery and you have lower FSH doses, an increased estradiol and an increased number of follicles, but you balance that against an increased risk of cancellation and potentially um, the risks of missing significant disease or an increased risk of infection. Overall, the pregnancy rates appear to be unchanged. So do women want surgery? And really, this is what all data needs to be about. We need to be looking at women-orientated outcomes. So if we look at the growth of IVF in Australia, you will see that there has been a massive increase in IVF in Australia, though the drop that you see at the end was in fact the impact of the financial crisis. At the same time, the rate of surgery has dropped massively. If we look at the conception rate with IVF in this group, you will see that our pregnancy rates have improved massively over the last 20 years. And if we look at income versus the cost of IVF, while well, the cost of IVF has gone up quite considerably, and in fact, as a multiple of a median income, it had not improved, it had not increased that significantly, though in fact over the last number of years it has now come down quite substantially, so that we're looking at a 1.2 time median monthly income uh, for a cost of an IVF cycle in Australia. So when we're looking at access to assisted reproduction, we need to look at accessibility versus affordability. Accessibility is how easily can people perform IVF procedures and affordability is whether or not they have the financial means to perform these. So in Australia, we're very lucky. We have a very high chance of, um, a very high access to IVF and IVF is also very affordable and therefore we have a high IVF rate. Almost 3% of all Australian conceptions now occur through IVF. The US, on the other hand, also has very good accessibility but very poor affordability. Uh, costs per cycle are very high compared to the median income. Places like Finland have excellent affordability, but accessibility is lower because there is a significant weight. Same also with New Zealand. The costs are very low, provided that you qualify, so therefore accessibility is lower. Other countries fall in between, as you see over here. UK is a good example of good accessibility and affordability, though in fact it is reducing because such competition. Israel has very high access to IVF and has probably one of the highest IVF rates in the world. So if we look at this um, directly, then you will see that the factors that determine access to assisted reproduction are the accessibility, affordability, and of course also the efficacy of uh, assisted reproduction in each country. We need to compare this to surgery where in fact all of these criteria also apply. And it is the particular resource setting in each country that will determine which of these routes um, patients will take. So, surgery is mainly dependent on the activity of an individual, whereas assisted reduction and IVF is really under the care of a unit and is, sub, uh, and is subject to all of those requirements. 
surgery has a very high skill base so you need to be seeing an endometriosis surgeon to get some of the results that have been uh, quoted particularly with the higher levels of disease whereas assisted reproduction really has a fairly low skill base surgery is very practitioner dependent whereas assisted reproduction to a great degree is practitioner independent it really doesn't matter who does the egg pickup there is very limited reproducibility for surgery because it is such an individual task whereas assisted reproduction by its nature because it's independent of the predict of the practitioner is really quite reproducible there is inconsistent quality control within surgery though we have certain requirements um, whereas assisted reproduction is highly quality controlled in each of the uh, jurisdictions both have limited transparency for the consumer in terms of what is actually uh, provided surgery relies on an individual medical practice whereas assisted reproduction is really corporatized medical practice uh, and it's a business model and therefore is subject to all of the issues associated with corporatized medical so we're looking at a patient-centered approach where the patient is at the center of her preferences the information that's provided the physical support the emotional support family wishes and um, acceptance continuity of care and the resources that are provided then really in this particular situation where we're looking at resources preferences and if the correct information is provided to the patient if you tell your patient that you're going with surgery from a pregnancy rate of two to six percent per cycle whereas assisted reproduction from two percent to almost thirty percent per cycle no guess really on what they're going to take in most situations and this explains the rise and rise of IVF in this situation this is Louise Brown born in June of 1978 she is our oldest IVF patient and when we're to comparing conceptions between natural conception and IVF conception we need to just remember that we're not comparing apples with apples but that we're comparing apples with oranges for there are significant differences between naturally conceived children and IVF conceived children now there is no increased risk of aneuploidy but there is an increased risk of aneuploidy with ICSI epigenetics we do know that there are some changes and so from the animal kingdom we know of a large offspring syndrome that occurs with IVF and some of these conditions such as the Angelman syndrome Prader-Willi syndrome Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome may be increased in certain IVF procedures particularly with ICSI though we accept that the prevalence of these conditions is really quite low congenital abnormalities seem to be increased in women in children conceived through IVF though again the absolute risk of these conditions is very low singletons conceived through IVF are more likely to be delivered preterm more likely to have a lower birth weight more likely to be small for gestational age more likely to have a cesarean section and more likely to be seen in hospital early on in life multiple pregnancies do significantly better than um, spontaneously conceived multiple pregnancies again probably as a function of monitoring and early intervention so when we're looking at the long-term effects of children conceived through IVF we really are looking at an increased risk of consultation and admission early in life increased development as far as we know increased height at puberty in some data there may be increased obesity increased heart disease increased cardiovascular disease and an increased risk of infertility now all of these potentially in fact really just represent the type of people who have to have IVF rather than a particular issue with IVF itself however when we're considering whether or not someone should have surgery and spontaneous conception rather than IVF 
all of this information needs to be taken into account, bearing in mind that we really have limited data on the long-term outcome of our IVF. Thank you very much.